What is up, Buck? I am Doug with Dini in the garage, and today we're discussing and fixing a known cooling issue on these two liter turbo Jeep engines. The vehicle in this video is gonna be this 2001 Jeep Wrangler JLU, but this will be the same for any Jeep vehicle that has the two liter turbo. Now the way this cooling issue manifests on these two liter turbos is usually like this. You're going around driving your business, you've noticed nothing wrong with the Jeep. You don't see coolant leaking underneath it, you haven't really smelled coolant during operations, but lo and behold, you're driving along and you get a ding. You look down at your dash and the Jeep is overheating. I pegged at about 250 degrees degrees as that's when the overheat alarm comes on on these vehicles. If that's the issue you're having, you need to come right here to this coolant bottle. These vehicles do not have a radiator cap on top of the radiator the way a normal vehicle would. The only radiator cap is back here on the coolant reservoir bottle. And if you're having the issue I described where your vehicle is randomly overheating and you're not sure why, you're going to want to inspect this coolant bottle and there's a very good chance you will see something similar to what we're seeing here. This is coolant that has been boiling out the side of this tank. And why would coolant be boiling out the side of my reservoir bottle, I hear you saying? Well, unfortunately, that is down to a design flaw, an engineering error. You will notice this is a plastic reservoir bottle. Plastic has all the characteristics of plastic. What is directly next to that plastic bottle? I'll answer it for you. It's the turbo. What do turbos do? They get hot. What does plastic do when it gets hot? It fails. You picking up what I'm throwing down here? These bottles fail on most of these Jeeps because of where they are in the engine bay, getting super cooked by that turbo all the time. This pink stuff is your coolant, that's the telltale. With the other telltale being that the bottle is gonna be completely empty when you finally do get into it. Why is this one so tight? What's going on here? Now, while it's absolutely terrible that Chrysler saddled this otherwise very good engine with this terrible cooling issue by way of, I don't know, probably two engineers not talking to each other, it's mercifully easy to repair. You can do the whole thing with 10 millimeter and some tools that you have sitting in your garage. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is go ahead and pry off this little connector right here. You can use a screwdriver or something like this. You see that's just a pressure clip and you can go ahead and remove this top hose as well. Now it's two tens up here. And then you should be able to pop the bracket up and out. Now there's another connector down below and there are a couple ways to get this guy off. You can remove this hose clamp right here or there's a little wire bale up here that you can pry off with a screwdriver. Let me get it out and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Here is the coolant bottle out. You can see it's still attached to this bracket via this one 10 millimeter here. But here's the elbow that goes on the bottom of this. It only fits on one way, has to index in, and then there's a wire that comes in from the back, which I lost <laughs> while I was taking mine apart that I'm either gonna have to find or rebuild. But you can either pop that wire out of the back right here with a screwdriver, and then it slides off, or there's that traditional hose clamp on this end. I have seen some people, a few, that had a crack in this, not in this, but that will be evident by where that sludgy pink mess is. Mine being right on the side, I think this plastic weld, you can kind of see where it's almost bulged out a little bit right there. It uh, failed because of the heat of the turbo. Does that mean the new one's gonna fail? Probably, but I'm working on a heat shield. Let's go look at swapping the new one onto this bracket. If you're going to look for a replacement, I highly recommend you get the Mopar one. The problem with the Chinese ones is that they're Chinese and cheap and they blow apart catastrophically in like two months. I have about 20 stories from the internet or from viewers of people that put in a cheap $20 Amazon one and it catastrophically failed. Now you can drive it the way that one is for quite a while, just keep adding cooling. But if it catastrophically fails, uh, you're getting towed home, buddy. And just to add insult to injury, the Mopar ones are actually very hard to find. It took about three weeks before this one was in stock at Rock Auto. All right, this ain't rocket surgery, so don't overthink it. You got that one 10 millimeter on the bottom, and once that's out, you can slide the whole thing back and pop it right out of that bracket. Pull the new one out. I would confirm that it matches exactly with the old one. Start at the front with the locating tab. Push the whole thing in as long as that 10 millimeter bolt goes in. You got the bad boy oriented correctly. It's ready to go back into the vehicle. See, I told you it was not rocket surgery, so don't overthink it. All right, so we have our new coolant bottle put onto our bracket. We just have to decide how we want to put this elbow on. I like to put the elbow in the Jeep first because that hose clamp is harder than this little clip. Worth noting I lost my little clip, so I had to make a new one out of a stretched out cotter pin. But really, all this little clip does is it goes on this elbow like that, and then the wires stick into the side so that when you put the bottle on, it clicks and it won't come out. 
and even this janky little one that I did, that's gonna hold it just fine. So I highly recommend you don't lose yours, but if you do, it's not hard to make a new one. I bet you have to buy the whole elbow otherwise, and it's probably 40 bucks. So if you're gonna put the elbow into the Jeep first, make sure your clip is in and seated. Come on back over here and slide this guy on. Really hard to get to the hose connector with the pliers when it's underneath the bottle. So if you put that on first, all you need to do is take your reservoir and clip it in. Give it a good tug. Make sure it's not gonna come off. And that's pretty much it. Now we need to relocate this bracket. This hole on the bottom has a grommet in it. And that grommet goes right on this stud here, right next to your brake booster. You see that gray painted stud? You get your bracket on that stud, as well as over these two threaded studs up here. And you're pretty much done. Put your two nuts on. Make sure we reattach this top line. There we go. And then finally, you can put this little retaining clip back in here so that that bracket's not weeble wobbling in the wind. You've now installed a new reservoir bottle into your Jeep with a two liter turbo. Congratulations, you're not done though. Cause you gotta refill the system with coolant, obviously. Otherwise you're not, you haven't fixed anything. You just put a new part in, you didn't really do anything. And these Jeeps do have a kind of complicated recommended coolant bleeding system because they don't have a normal radiator cap and there's all kinds of spots in the system for air to get caught. You're supposed to use a vacuum bleeding tool, which a lot of new cars you're supposed to use on, but I'm not gonna be doing that. Because I have found that through patience and attention to detail and generally knowing what you're doing and what you should be looking for, you can bleed these the traditional way, run it, fill it, run it, fill it, but you have to be careful. There's a lot of air pockets in this system and if you just chuck some coolant in here and then run it and never think about it again, you may get an air pocket and you may overfill it. So if you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know what you're doing and you haven't been bleeding radiator systems your whole life, either buy the tool, it's about $100 at Harbor Freight, I'll leave a link down below, or take it to a shop, fill it, do all this yourself so they don't charge you an arm or leg, take it to a shop to fleet it. But if you wanna do it my way, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna fill the system as much as it'll go. It's worth noting, on these coolant bottles, this hole right there is the overflow hole. And it's positioned right like this. So as you're filling, if you're pouring onto this side of the fill, you will see it dribbling out kind of like that, the bottom of your reservoir. And you will think that you have a leak or a hole or you missed something, but that's not the case. I made that mistake myself. So watch for that little overflow hole right there and go ahead and get to filling. A funnel will help. But is non-essential. Oh it, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe it is essential, I don't know. Okay, maybe a funnel's very essential. All right, now that bad boy is filled right to the top. But as you can see, it dropped little by little on its own. If you squeeze some of the hoses, you might be able to get some more air out. There you go, and it'll drop even more. That's this upper radiator hose right here that I'm squeezing, making our level go down. So keep filling and manipulating hoses until you can't get any more air out of the system. All righty, so we're just gonna let this run a little bit, keep an eye on it, and add coolant as we need it. Now inside the Jeep, you can keep an eye on the coolant temperature on the dash there. You're also gonna wanna turn your HVAC all the way up, all the way on hot. That'll help you get all the air bubbles out, especially those ones caught up in your heater core there. Let's go talk about coolant for a second while this thing's running. Now modern cooling systems require modern coolant. You're gonna need that purple or pink stuff. It's uh, the stuff for Jeep, Ram, Dodge, and Chrysler from 2000 and on, the one that is good for hybrids and EVs because that two liter turbo is the same one they used in the mild hybrids and some of the other hybrids. So you're gonna wanna make sure you're using the right coolant, though don't mistake this for the battery coolant. That is a whole another story for a whole other day. We'll talk about battery coolant when I don't have a headache. Alrighty friends, I ran this bad boy in the driveway twice. Let it get up to temperature, cool all the way down, add some coolant, run it all the way up to temperature, let it cool down, go to add some coolant. On the second one, it took very little coolant. So I took it for a nice long test drive, about 25 minutes on the highway and up and down mountain roads, and I couldn't get it to go above 201 degrees. This is interesting because previously when this old bottle was installed, preventing the cooling system from pressurizing on those same mountain roads and highway drive, it would routinely get up to 220, even 230 degrees. Now, if you look around online, you'll find a lot of guys implying that these 
these Jeeps like to run hotter. Some say it's because of the turbo. Some say it's because of the e-torque that some of them have. Some people will even tell you that it's an emissions thing and it's designed to run hotter to burn more of the emissions gases. I don't think that's true because when we got this Jeep, it was running around 200 degrees. All of the official documentation suggests it's supposed to run around 200 degrees. And now that the cooling system is properly pressurizing again, it is once again operating around 200 degrees. So what I think is actually happening is that most of the two liter Jeeps out there on the road are experiencing a mild failure of their cooling system, preventing it from properly pressurizing, leading to the Jeep running around 220, 230 degrees. In my specific uh, experience, I would notice that around 222, the fan would kick into high, and then around 250, you'd actually get the overheat alarm. So it makes sense based on every other car ever that it, you know, 220 is like the high mark, that's the high side of normal, and then around 250 is when you're gonna actually start having problems. The point being, if yours is routinely running at 220 or 230, I would do a pressure test or maybe inspect your bottle or something else to try to confirm that your cooling system is actually cooling up to the standards it was designed for. So just as a final note, using the old style, more traditional bleed and fill, bleed and fill method, I have had good luck previously and this time, I mention it again because I don't want to instruct you to do the same if you don't know what you're doing. If you've never done this before, if you're not comfortable with the idea of being responsible for whether or not the vehicle overheats, fill it yourself at home, take it to somebody else to bleed it, because if you get an air bubble and you don't know what you're doing and you miss something, you could cook your engine, cook your turbo, cook all kinds of things. And friends, that's all there is to it. It's not an issue I was looking to solve on this Jeep, not work I wanted to do, but ultimately, uh, not a very bad job. This is about $50 on Rock Auto. My advice for you, if you have one of these two liter turbos, is maybe pick one of these up, keep it on the shelf, maybe keep it in the back of the Jeep because you could definitely change this on the side of the road or at least keep some JB Weld with you. I have heard about uh, people where they, they crack right under this plastic weld and you might be able to JB Weld it and get yourself home. So that would be my advice. Now, let's shoot the elephant in the room. These two liter turbos. Are they good motors? Well, if you go online and you look, you'll find a bunch of people telling you not to buy one, but if you dig deeper, none of those people own one or ever own one. And if you find the people that did own them, they'll tell you, I love that thing. The main issue most people have with them is the propensity for a, what appears to be random overheating, but it's not random overheating. They put a plastic reservoir right next to a super hot turbo and the plastic begins to fail. And usually it doesn't fail catastrophically. It seeps out and boils out like mine was doing, like yours is probably doing. And then one day you just don't have enough cooling and your Jeep pegs to 250 and you're wondering what in the frig is going on? I just told you. So I'd love to hear from you down in the squawk boxes. Do you have a Wrangler or a compass or something with this motor in it? How do you feel about it? Have you had this issue? And if so, how did you fix it? If you're having issues getting the cooling system bled or replacing the bottle or figuring out that little elbow at the bottom, by all means, leave me a comment down there in the squawk boxes. I will mention real quick for longtime viewers, this is the wife's vehicle. Some of you have noticed there's been a couple videos on it. There will continue to be a couple videos on it. And no, I'm never gonna stop making videos on Jeep Grand Cherokees. But this is a fun little vehicle, man, and I'm having fun making some videos on it. So please don't be alarmed. We're not turning into a Wrangler channel, just a Jeep channel that now owns a Wrangler as well. Now I'm telling you, this thing is fun. We've had it on road trips, we've had it off road. We've done a lot of stuff. It's a cool little vehicle. I dig it. I wasn't a fan of modern Jeeps until the wife brought this thing home and now, I don't know, I'm converted. Where do I get a few of those ducks for my dashboard?